field is where Fred Gibson should have been, so it's Alan Grice by himself. So Terry Shield has the open run right behind him with Steve Marston and the Big Falcon and the Blue Falcon of Dick Johnson with clear road ahead if only he can persuade Terry Shield or Marston to move over. Probably won't happen, but Johnson will be looking for a quick start. breaks and Alan Grice sideways off the line being chased here by Terry Sheel on the inside. Masters is making a move up on the outside. Sheel elects to run the inside. Johnson keeping them company as they go to the top of Marlborough and now down into Dunlop Loop for the first time. Alan Grice in the citizen car coming through the corner with Steve Masters and they made a beautiful start. Terry Sheel back in third place. Dick Johnson did well. He saw Masters and go through. Elected to follow him. One falcon he reckoned. Whoops, a falcon tripping up then. One falcon he reckoned could clear the way for him, so he put him behind. He's in fourth spot at the moment and well positioned. But look at Steve Marston really going very hard. Oh, Terry Shields come on the inside. Grice has gone wide and it was nudged out. He lost it a little bit. Marston came on the inside when Grice swung back. Marston was there to nudge him and Shields has put him off. Now Dick Johnson goes through in the second spot. Marston has dropped back to third and we're only three quarters of the way through the first lap. Terry Shield, the man who holds the lap record in front. Dick Johnson right behind him. Marston coming back again and is out. Gun. The national touring car champion to take second spot and that is the end of the first lap a sensational start to the better break series for 1983. nine laps still remain to the top of bitch pave again terry shield driving the eurocars valvoline mazda heads down into dunlop corner steve masterton and the master v8 falcon running in second place and using all of the circuit in that corner dick johnson of queensland and car number 17 moves up now into third place as they work the back part of the circuit coming down towards Honda Corner and uh, car number uh, 17 Johnson has made up a little ground on Masterton but at the moment the RX-7 out in front number 37 and running away a little bit as they go down towards Winfield Corner is of course Terry Shield. Gary Wilmington is leading the rest in fourth place in car number eight then Terry Finnegan in the Commodore but let's follow the leaders and it's a hard driving Terry Shield in front Steve Marston going as hard as ever using all the road and then some occasionally in front of Dick Johnson and that is a great thrill for this young Sydney driver but Terry Shield, the man who holds the lap record here 53.5 in front Marston trying to haul him back again and Dick Johnson's just about staying in sight doesn't seem to be quite as fast as Marston which is a bit of a surprise but look how hard Marston is going taking up all the road you'll see him when we change angle to watch them come through head on look at the second car driving desperately hard is Steve Marston then Dick Johnson at this stage, we have Terry Shield starting to stretch that lead just a little bit over Masterton. There's car number two, Steve Masterton, a former Rookie of the Year at uh, the James Hardy 1000 at Bathurst. Campaigned here for a couple of years in the Ford Capris. First outing for Masterton in the V8 car at this circuit, driven for the first time in uh, last year's James Hardy 1000 Classic. Off the Malco turn and under the camera position, just how close those cars go to the fence. Fourth car through was Terry Finnegan in the blue Gary Wilmington and the Falcon and bringing up the best of the rest was one of the Mazdas number 50 Peter McLeod oh, he's going hard you can see how Marston is throwing the tail and held it very well then almost at the point of losing it a very fast line a bit hard on the tyres but he only has 10 laps to go and he held that slide beautifully Marston really has developed in the four years we've seen him motor racing in top class company because it wasn't the best year for Falcons, as Dick Johnson discovered. But uh, he is persevering with it and really has the car going well today because this isn't the circuit that suits a large car. It's all twists and turns, and he's about to come towards the only real straight in the circuit. Marshall through. Here comes Dick Johnson in third place. Johnson. The Queenslander. 19 years of motor racing variety of cars but undoubtedly he's well known for his exploits in the Falcon. He's taken over the mantle once worn so well by Alan Moss, the bearer of the standard for Ford. It's Dick Johnson these days who carries the flag for and does it so well. Running in third place in this race. Let's take a look at some information on Dick Johnson. 38 years of age, professional race car driver of course uh, was well known because of the bad luck that uh, deceased him at Bathurst a couple of years ago. Came back to go on and win the race, the accident shortened race the following year. National Touring Car Champion of Australia. Comes from Daisy Hill in Queensland and one of Australia's most popular touring car races. Dick Johnson from Queensland. Quite a good battle game in the fifth place.
Bush just coming through the corner where Vakadi is at the moment. What's that, maybe 200, 300 metres behind the leaders. A battle between Gary Wilmington in car number eight and Peter McLeod in car 50. They're having a tussle. The rest of the early runners fairly well strung out, all within sight of each other. And the closest, I suppose, the leading two. Johnson threw in third place. Battle just behind him, between the Falcon and the Mazda RX-7. Ten laps, uh, races beyond that distance here in the touring cars tend to really favour the uh, the Mazdas, and of course, unfortunately, the turbo that isn't starting today. But even at this stage in the heat here today at uh, Amaru Park, Terry Shield is running um, away from the race the stage. There's the battle for fifth place with uh, the young driver Gary Wilmington in the big four, a little fella Gary, and Peter McLeod running in his Mazda RX-7. Running with new sponsorship, a beautifully presented car, as Peter always has. And look how hard he's going, really trying to get by the big car. A little fast through the corners, loses out a little bit on the straights, where the big V8 squirts away a bit. But McLeod will be trying to hang on to him now, because if he can stay close and get a bit of an aerodynamic tow up the straight, and he's just close enough to get some advantage, he'll try and outbreak him. He may make a move here. We'll probably see the next two or three bends. Oh, that might have cost him a few fractions of a second. Just put the wheel in the dirt. But if he can stay close, keep inside, McLeod then can mount a challenge on these next two bends. He'll stay close behind on Mazda. Not a good corner for the Mazdas, despite the name very fast suits the V8s. Takes a good line here, and he'll try for an inside move as they come down towards the next bend, which is to the left, Honda. Let's see what he can do. He can get through quickly and out fast. He may have a chance of challenging Wilmington here. He stays close, but Wilmington's got a pretty cool head. He's a tiny fella, isn't he? He's just right down in the car. And McLeod is right behind him. Lost a little bit in the under acceleration, but does do better in the cornering and in the braking. Nibbling away at the tail of the big Falcon. Nick Johnson going beneath and here's this great scrap Wilmington McLeod right behind him working the front straight here at Amaru Park and heading up Bitchapave Hill again may have him this time if he can just get close on the braking get that inside line but no Wilmington moves across and closes the door thank you that's the way I'd prefer to go so McLeod tries the outside he can't possibly get down there but if he can just promote Wilmington to a bit of a slide he may take him on the inside he's just trying but Wilmington holds the line and comes round this is a good battle going on between these two Again, though, McLeod will try and get himself into position to take him on the run down towards Honda. This is the, really the only left-hand bend on the track. Wilmington holds the line, won't go too wide, but McLeod is very close this time. He may now, as they go down towards Winfield, be able to position himself to come through on the inside. If he can break very late, let's see what he does. But Wilmington is leaving his break into a desperately late moment. McLeod on the inside, he won't have the legs out to get past him. Recognises that, said, OK, I'll stay close as I can. Fast through as they go sweeping round towards CRC straight. Now he's on, on the side, if he can just hold there and get the line, but Wilmington is going to close over and say, no, thank you, that'll do me. McLeod trying again, no, he can't get through there. Once again, he puts his wheels into the dirt as he tries to go on the outside. He was, again, he's trying to rattle Wilmington, make him go wide. Wilmington has gone wide, McLeod's going in the inside, but just doesn't have the legs to get through, and Wilmington again closes on him, and McLeod has to let the, let the Mazda drift wide, right behind him again, looking for a way around. He is quicker on the bends, but the Falcon has the squirt to stay in front. You can see the leaders just ahead of them. That's how close they are. Again, McLeod's trying on the inside, but he's touching that curb there, lifting the wheels up, wags the tail a little bit. That'll cost him a fraction of a second they've covered a total now of nine laps last lap board is up terry shields still the race leader steve masterton in second place then gary warmington that we're following at the moment and peter mcleod in the yellow master rx7 really keeping him honest as the two cars work into the last lap here he goes on the inside but again warmington manages to close the gate there so it's been uh, an interesting race so far as uh, McLeod is concerned. Here's the race leader, though, Terry Shields in the Eurocars RX-7 coming down the short straight. A little bit sideways there, down to the left-hander. At Honda Corner, there's Dick Johnson running in third at the moment as they come in with half a lap remaining in this race. Fourth place is the, um, the Commodore of Terry Finnegan and then the battle for fifth place that we're following. Dick Johnson in third spot. He's got a few more chances today to do better than that. Been a good outing by Terry Shield, though. And so to the last corner with Terry Shield coming out to go on and score a great win. Steve Masterton placing second, and Queensland, Dick Johnson takes third place. Let's take a look again at what happened in the opening lap of this first heat. 
It was Alan Grice who was leading, coming down to Honda Corner. And a little touch there from behind from Steve Masterton takes Grice around. Terry Shield decides through the inside is the only way to go. He clashes with the inside of Masterton's car. Grice goes for the terra firma and Shield goes through to take the lead. There's the man who won though, Terry Shield, in the very smartly presented Eurocars Mazda peripheral ported RX-7. Position number 14, an unlikely starter car, 41, Barry Jones' RX-7 Mazda. So again, Alan Grice, Terry Scheel and Steve Master to provide the action. Ten seconds to go. Dick Johnson sitting in there will be looking for a good start. Off to a good start and Grice... Terry Scheel has stalled. Terry Scheel has stalled. The car's behind, miss him, but Scheel, who won the first round, is out. Grice has got him. Wilmington doing very well to move up towards second spot. Terry Finnegan trying to get his Commodore between the two of them. And Steve Marston behind on a wall of cards in second spot. But it is Alan Grice well clear in the Commodore that he's rented virtually from Greg Comber or Ken Matthews. He's out in front. The rest of the field pouring through. And Terry Shield has had a push start back on the starting grid. He's in pursuit of them. But he's got 10 laps to go. And he's a long way behind as the field pours around the back part of the circuit. Down to Honda Corner, Alan Grice. Leads out of the corner. Car number six, Gary Wilmington holding down second spot in the Falcon car number eight. Steve Masterton, Falcon second and third at this stage, then the first of the Commodores, driven by Terry Finnegan. This stage, Grice has it all to do. The Citizen car, number six, leading down to Wonderlick Turn, brings the cars back onto the home straight for the completion of one lap. Alan Grice said to be having a better race than last time. He didn't survive the first lap when his Commodore was just touched from the back and spun out wide, and that was the end of the race as far as he was concerned. But he's back with a vengeance. He has wall-to-wall -wall Falcons behind him, and they're led by number eight, Gary Wilmington, Steve Masterton right behind him, going very, very hard. Then there's uh, one Commodore in there, which is the... Um, Terry Finnegan car just in front of Dick Johnson and Peter Dane, uh, Peter uh, McLeod rather in the RX-7 behind and what a have. battle going on there. The big scrap is actually behind Masterton who locks up a break, then Wilmington, then uh, Terry Finnegan and the Commodore, they've been juggling around there looking for positions and, and uh, Finnegan now on the inside of uh, Wilmington with Dick Johnson in amongst them. Dick Johnson really looking for a way around there, Masterton in the meantime going extremely well. Pat, oh there's a little waggle there from, <laughs> as Wilmington. you can see, Wilmington who was into the fence and out of it again, he's hit it a few times, so how far he goes I don't know, no he's into the fence. And how well the Masterton cars have been prepared since uh, Pat Purcell has uh, joined their team. Of course, Purcell was linked with Bob Jane for so many years and it's uh, put Bob on the winner's roster for uh, probably at just over five or six years. At the moment, though, he's with the Masterton team and here is Steve Masterton coming down the outside of Alan Grice as they go down to the right hand and now switches back on the inside. He can't get through there and Ice. Grice is going to make sure he can't, but Grice held his car magnificently, went sideways, collected it, hardly lost any speed at all. I don't believe that. We'll see that again in replay. But we saw Masterton go on the inside and pick up the dirt. But he is Grice's uh, back um, or perhaps, yes, Grice has gone with a tyre going. I think you're going to get a tyre on the tyre. Well, he, he won't be happy about that, let me tell you. And he has just pulled it round the inside yep. and gone. And here he goes, surf and turf, Alan Grice at Amaru Park. Off the racetrack in the rented Citizen Cup. Well, he'll be furious. That means they will be twice now that's happened to me with the same guy. Alan is not the most forgiving driver on the track. And uh, it looked as though the wheel was jammed in and was burning on the guard. Let's just watch the lead, though, driving as we have never seen him drive before, Steve Marston. He has Terry Finnegan behind him. He locks up a brake. Finnegan comes through the smoke behind. Dick Johnson, you may have heard of that fellow before. He's in third place, not too far behind. Can't do much about catching either of this pair, but is well within contention and has Peter McLeod right behind him in the slick RX-7. But these are the leaders, and Marston is driving as we have never seen this young fellow go before. You can see the damage on the front of his car where he came into contact with Alan Grice for the second time at this meeting, I should point out. And Terry Finnegan, who really is underrated, overlooked drivers is very close in his Commodore and he is likely to give Marston a bit of a rough time because Finnegan knows his way around. He's a well seasoned driver, much more experienced than Marston has and the Commodore may prove to be a slightly easier handful around here as the race wears on. He really is driving a superlative race. Very aggressive. Just ask Alan Grice and he'll agree with that. Oops. 
Well, he must be the panel beater's friend. There was just a slight touch of paint. Didn't do any damage to the car. I would say it took one foul of the white paint off. But it did allow Finnegan to get just a little bit closer. He came around the corner more cleanly. He's made him a bit of ground, and more important, he came out faster from that bend, and he really has closed up on Marston. And if Finnegan's going to make a challenge, he'll be in this next lap, and he's close enough now to do it. And you can see that Marston's in some distress. Finnegan's got it. He's on the inside. And Marston will be cursing with himself. A break block now. Probably a fault of the break rather than himself. But he's going on the inside. He can't get through there. Well, he doesn't know that. He's only young. But Finnegan knows it, and he closes the path for him. But now Marston has to get by, and he will try. He will try. He has two laps to go, a little less than that. And now Marston, who has led much of the race, having disposed of, in the very strict meaning of the word, Alan Grice, is seeing if he can do the same thing to Terry Finnegan. But Finnegan's in front. He wants to stay that way. Where's Dick Johnson? Well, Dick is back in third place, but you can forget about him as far as winning the race because he'd be 200 metres behind this pair. Going well, 200 metres in front of Peter McLeod and the slick RX-7. But these are the pair who are in contention. They get the last lap sign on the left. You can see it. And away they go. And now Master takes himself a deep breath and says, OK, here I go. To the top of Bitchapave Hill, down now into the loop. And Masterton is close. Here's Finnegan, though. Finnegan using the little inside line, takes the car out to the outside and brings it back nicely. In the next corner, works to the back straight away. Masterton only has half a lap if he's going to be able to pull off a win here, and he's going to have to do it on the virtually the last straight. The Commodore of Terry Finnegan leading Steve Masterton and the Falcon in third place being held down by Brisbane's Dick Johnson in another Falcon. But quite relief here for uh, Finnegan, who gets off the hook and steams down now to the uh, last right-hand turn. Closing it up to him is Steve Masterton, but heat number two of the Better Brax Amscar series here at Amaru Park is going to go to a Commodore driver. Last corner coming up, and Terry Finnegan will go on and score a win. Second place will go to Steve Masterton in car number two, and third place will go to Queensland's Dick Johnson in car number 17. A section of the... Heat number two of the better breaks will be remembered for the dice between Alan Grice and Steve Masterton. Grice leading in the Citizen number six car, but Masterton was to arrive on the inside of him, approaching Winfield Corner. Masterton went on the inside, cut the grass, Grice got the car around sideways, but at least was able to continue. Positions unchanged. Well, stepping straight out of the race car after two fairly eventful heats of the Better Break series today, what's on the mind of Alan Grice? Seems like you're, you're attracting the front of other cars. Oh, it's one other car in particular that seems to be attracted to the back of my car. Um, I don't know the cause of it. I can't imagine what's in the fella's mind, but uh, I think you probably saw what happened on the uh, replays. Um, I think I was hit three times in the first uh, half lap of the first heat and uh, quite convincingly over there in the corner, which uh, put a guard onto the tyre, and uh, that was the end of that race. There was a suggestion that you were filing a process. Is that correct, Alan? No, um, I don't believe in that. Uh, but if the officials don't do something about it, uh, I'll uh, do something about it in, a, in my other way. What you're saying is perhaps uh, the other driver involved, who is Steve Masterton, has been a little over-exuberant today. <laughs> Master and I, 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 I tidy that up. <clears throat> the elections are over. <laughs> I know. I'll get off the fence. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I think the officials will do something about it. It was pretty blatant, unnecessary. We're not racing with sheep stations here. Uh, if, the, if that's the attitude of the bloke and the officials don't do something about it, then uh, the, those same set of rules should apply for me and uh, I'll do something about it. Cars coming on the grid for the Coca-Cola Bottlers Formula B race. Ten lap Mazda. There's Peter Fitzgerald. Bob Stevens, as you can see on the other side of the circuit on the inside. And a great scrap we should have going up the hill for the first time. Fitzgerald in an earlier race made a bad start and dropped back to fifth place, so he and the Porsche will be trying very hard to keep alongside Bob Stevens in the big Monaro. So watch him on the right-hand side of your screen with the red and blue stripes across the nose. The flag is raised. they go with Stevens on the inside but Fitzgerald goes through to take over the lead to stretch it. Heading up Fitcher Bay for the first time and marking a uh, gap for third is John Burke as they go to the top. Almost a touch there between the two cars and Stevens manages to fight back and take over the lead dropping into Dunlop for the first time. There's the field going through with Stevens leading from Fitzgerald and John Burke in third place. Well, that was a brave move by Stevens because he was outgunned from the line, but he just went deeper and faster, and Fitzgerald had to be satisfied with second spot. 
This is the one corner of the suit. He's on the inside and can go hard. Where the weight is on the inside of the car, he's not going to have a slight change of weight distribution. He's picked up ground. He'd be no more than three lengths behind and breaking hard closes up even more, as you can see. And now he has an excellent view of the Monaro's boot as they go around Winfield and Fitzgerald now is very well placed. If he can just hold up this sort of station, keep close to Stevens up the straight, he has a good chance of pulling by and trying to pass him as they break at the top for Dunlop. A big, long sweep round to the right. Now, Stevens pulls away a little bit, but Fitzgerald will close here. Under breaks and goes in very close. We'll go a little bit wide to try and get a line through on the inside, and he's well placed now. If he's going to make a move, it'll be in this next lap. Stevens still leading, coming down uh, through uh, Peter Warren turn into the back straight. Peter Fitzgerald closer than he's been at any stage of the race as they head down now towards Honda. Stays to the outside, now tucks in right behind Stevens. They come through the corner, thought about a little inside pass as they go down the little section there with the kink to the right. And at this stage, Stevens still managing to uh, hold the lead that he has for the last couple of laps. Fitzgerald hasn't given up trying. He's still sitting there, running the 3.2 litre fuel injected flak six months, which, uh, according to Peter, is developing somewhere between 340 and 350 brake horsepower. So he's giving away a little in terms of horsepower to Stevens car, which I would think would be in the terms of 450. That's right, and probably not a great deal of difference in the weight, even though the course is much smaller. It is probably a heavier car, certainly in relation to its total size on the, the lightweight Monaro that Stephen is driving, which is a very specialised specially prepared car, sports sedan, category, which doesn't allow all sorts of modifications. Yeah, well, he's trying so hard. He knows he has to do well on the parts where the car is quick. That's one of the parts where it is very fast, and he threw it in there at a tremendous velocity. He lost a little bit of ground, but kept the car bit under under control. Now he's trying. He's going in very late and deep. Again, he knows he has to be fast through the next bend. Not this one. He wants to be fast, of course, but the next bend is critical. He doesn't have the same punch as the V8, so he has to go through very fast, stay on his tail, and get out of there quickly, which he's done. This time he is well placed. He's back a little bit in the aerodynamic drag. He'll lose a bit of ground up the straight, because this is where Stevens is so fast. But he'll come in hard now. Let's see how well he takes down that loop. If he can just keep the car under control, which he's done, and get very close to the tail of Stevens, he has a good chance then of going hard through here and maybe picking up ground around Honda, which is the left-hander. Down towards the sweep, known as Mazda Curve. Now, there's a whole gaggle of cars in front. Let's see who it helps. They see them coming. They're through the first. They've got three more to go. They come into Honda. They'll be right on the tails of the other cars. They come through. Well, the Mazda drives the season, but moves over. But that's where uh, Stevens wants to go. Fitzgerald moves, but he's bought by Stevens. who had to go there. And the two of them go through on the inside and through the cars. There's traffic everywhere here at the moment. Fitzgerald now is right on the tail of Stevens. It's a case of cool heads here. He's almost beside him, but Stevens still has the power and pulls out on the inside of the Tirana. Fitzgerald will follow him through. They're both through the traffic safely, but Fitzgerald is closer. He's making a passing move now as they come across the line. They've got themselves another three minutes to go. Fitzgerald will drop him back a little bit, but he'll close up here under brakes. He'll go for the inside. Stevens sees him and will block him. Let's see how they come out. Stevens still in front. Fitzgerald closing. Well, the battle still goes on. There's not much difference in the pace, and Fitzgerald just can't get by. He's making life fairly difficult for Bob Stevens, but Stevens' knowledge of this particular circuit uh, is perhaps uh, in his favour today. They're running up into some of the slower traffic, and Stevens is exactly at the right place at the right time. Once again, to Honda Corner, through the tight left-hander. That opens up to the little short straight with a kink to the right in it. Fitzgerald will close as they go down towards the next corner. That uh, rather uncompromising concrete wall facing there at the end of that straight. Now, the short straight, Lap starting to uh, really run out now, and they're in favour of Stevens. There's the, the skim the wall coming along the front straightaway with about two laps remaining. Bob Stevens in the Monaro, leading from Peter Fitzgerald. We're concentrating on the battle between these front two, but running third is John Burke in the Toyota Celica. He's ahead of Bob Kendall in the Tirana, and in uh, fourth place is Gary Wilmington mounted in the Mustang. But these two are the ones who are battling for the lead, and it's still Bob Stevens who leads Peter Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald lost a bit of ground that time as they went through traffic. Had to go wide in a very difficult line as he was lapping the car, and that's cost him a bit of ground. And now, with some more traffic ahead, he's trying to close the margin once more. He'll be hoping that Stevens will be slow as they approach the critical bend at Winfield Corner, the sharp right-hander. But it's essential that Fitzgerald be right on his tail. He's not, because Stevens now has a bit of a gap. But Fitzgerald very bravely goes flying through. You can see how hard he was going. He really had to get by that car before the corner, flung the tail out, kept the car under control. He's sliding everywhere. He knows he can't get too far back. But the last lap board has gone out, and I think Stephen's margin is too great. 
trying to overtake the traffic has cost Fitzgerald some room and he is now too far back I think to catch the man he's pursued all through the race but he'll certainly try he'll certainly try Stevens has played a good game of chess with Peter Fitzgerald in the, uh, the heavy traffic. Now it's the sprint to the line as they work to the back part of the circuit. Less than half a lap remaining now, heading down to Honda Corner. Still Bob Stevens and the trusty uh, Monaro out in front, Peter Fitzgerald in the Pal Color Porsche. Running in second, and here he comes. Has he made up ground? He's trying on that. He can't possibly get by there, but he'll try and swing to the inside, and there he goes. He's on the inside. He's starting in now. Can he hold the car? He's on the grass. It's a question of power on the Monaro. Monaro has it, but side by side they go down the back straight. The Monaro Stevens is in front. Fitzgerald's trying again. He's coming on the inside, and then the final squirt, desperate squirt for the line is Stevens. He goes across two wins from Peter Fitzgerald, and has Holden Monaro ahead of the Porsche RSR of Peter Fitzgerald. A great race between the leading two. In third place, car 77, John Burke in the Toyota Celica, then car 49, car 12, Ian Stewart in an Austin. In 17th place, car 72, Alan Barrow in an FJ Holden. In 18th position, car 95, N. McDonald in a Morris. 23 starters. The man to watch right at the back of the field in car 9, Peter Hopwood in the big Chevy Impala. Didn't practice, has to start from the back of the grid. The flag is about to go up and Hopwood has the job in front of him. 22 cars to pass. Flag at the ready. They're racing and getting underway quickly in the Pentex J Touring Car Race with Ken Matthews and the Mustang going away smartly. Look at Hopwood trying to force a passage through the inside. Now switches to the outside on some of these slower cars as he makes his way up the top of Bitcher Pave Hill, goes between two minis, and it's Matthews who leads over the top of the hill for the first time. A little mini getting into some strife there, but Hopwood has already passed about 10 cars, but uh, he already has another 12 still to pass as they work to the back part of the course, and still Ken Matthews and the Mustang running away with this one as they complete half a lap. And Hopwood is up in ninth place already and passing one of the minis, and that's an amazing progress. Whether he can catch the leader in only five laps, I think, is, is a too difficult a question, but still. He's sideways there, and Bruce Allen and the mini has made up uh, a little bit of ground as they come out of that corner and head down to Winfield, the right-hander, with Hopwood still cutting a, a way through this uh, very, very heavy traffic into about uh, eighth place in the field. There's Matthews. Second place being held down by Allen. And a whole gaggle of cars. There's Hopwood working to the inside as they come through on to the main straightaway. One lap down for Remain, and they're sideways, including Hopwood's big Chevrolet Impala. He has car one in front of him. That's David Clement. He should gobble up the Mini on the way up the hill. We'll see how they go. Mini pulls over to one side. That's where Peter Hopwood wants to go. And if I was in the Mini, I wouldn't stand in front of that uh, big Chevy. It'd be like driving a, a little brick and seeing a whole wall falling behind you. The Hopwood drive with a great deal of daring. This is for, for cars that used to race, touring cars that used to race from the mid-60s back to earlier cars. So if you remember those great days of racing, Norm Beatty, Peter Mallett, Matt and Brian Foley and the like, this will bring back some great memories. Not too many of the Chevy Impalas raced. Peter Hopwood got hold of one because it was a lot of fun and he certainly entertains the crowd. You can see there where he lent on the Cortina and the start line. Mind you, it wouldn't be too expensive to repair. The whole car cost him so little that he just goes out in the racing and enjoys it. It's just so much of it to repair. So much and so often, I suspect. There he is, wagging the tail in the middle of the field. He still has to get by uh, David Clement. He's doing a great job with the little mini there. He's uh, just behind Steve Williams in the hold and in 89 going through there, and surely this time he'll be able to get by Clement. In the meantime, it's back to the man leading the race, Ken Matthews, who's now under some sort of challenge from Bruce Allen, the mini, who has closed up. He's made up several carlings in the last lap. They've covered two and a half laps now, so the race is roughly halfway through. And if Allen is going to uh, win this race, he's got to get right up on the tail of Matthews, certainly within the next lap, to give himself maybe one and a half laps of time to try and pass. He's making up a lot of ground through these bends. This is a fast part of the course, and Allen is really flying. Look how he's closed up. Well, he really is in a competitive position now. He doesn't have the pace to lead him up the hill. He has to try and get by around some of the bends and build up some sort of lead to withstand a, a last-minute challenge that Matthews might be able to mount. But Alan is close. He has to stay on the tail and be as close as he can. He wants to pass as close as he can for the run up the straight. If he can get in close and get some sort of aerodynamic drag, some assistance there, he'll be in fairly good shape to get by as they go over the top of the mountain. The blue flag being waved to let Matthews know that there's someone behind him information that he probably already possesses. 
And you can see there the, the leg of the Mustang, the B8, pulling away from the Mini. Now, this is where Alan will make his challenge. He has to get up and hopefully get by in this lap. He is trying desperately hard across the road like a windscreen wiper. Comes in wide. He can go there deliberately. He went there because he couldn't keep it in close. But takes a good line pulling out of Dunlop. He's right on the tail of the Mustang. And maybe he can get by this time because he is very fast down here through Mazda and particularly through the left hand that's coming up. Oh, another wag of the tail. He'll come in hard here. But I think the Mustang will be there. No, he's, he's right alongside. So, excuse, excuse me. me. <laughs> I'm there. And Matthew said, huh? I heard you. I didn't see you. And all of a sudden, he sees him. There's him in front now. He's making a move to pass again. But if Alan can hold the inside line, he should come out in better shape through the corner. And this is side-by-side -side motoring. Alan will come through first. Now, where's Matthew's going to go? He's going to go behind him. That's where he will pass almost certainly going up the mountain. They're about to get the last lap board. It's being hung out now for the car, so he'll know how far to go, and he will have to get by Will Matthews to have any chance because he knows now the Mini is quick around the bends. Let's watch him on the big squirt up mountain. This is a critical part of the race. The Mini has to hold that inside line. If Matthews gets across and holds it, no, Alan's kept it. Alan will stay in front as they come over the top, and that was good driving, fairly breathtaking stuff. He stayed in front there. A little bit of opposite lock there to try and uh, get the car around the corner. And with uh, just a little over half a lap remaining, still 34, Bruce Allen. And Matthews will have to wait and see whether he can come back. This is the part of the circuit that obviously favours the Mini and Allen. Greg Topfer back in third place. And meanwhile, the Impala still tries to stalk its birds of prey down the back straight. Ian Stewart's up in fourth, which is an amazing result because he started from the 16th position on the grid. Allen leads. Ken Matthews brings the big ma big Mustang into sight. It's he who's playing the mini tactic now, trying to come in hard and fast, and he'll rely on the, the greater acceleration of the V8 here, but I don't think he can do it oh, because, oh, that's, he was trying hard. All he's done is take a lot of paint off the side of the car, controls it nicely, has done damage, has lost the race. Allen will go through, assuming he can keep it off the fence, and Matthews trying to keep Topfer at bay and keep the car straight, goes across for second place, Topfer second, and look who came up into uh, fourth place, rather. It was car nine with a big characteristic wag of the tail, Peter Hopper in the enormous Chevy Impala. The Andy, the Falcon and car number 14, or position 14, car number 41, Barry Jones. Ready for a start now in the third heat of the Venabreak series here at Amaru Park. Ten seconds to go before the start. a good start in the third heat and it's Steve Masterton getting away very quickly on the outside with Terry Sheel and the Master RX-7 the next best to come through. Gary Wilmington making a good break and on the inside of him goes Dick Johnson as they go to the top of the hill and drop now to Dunlop Loop and it's Masterton in front the RX-7 of Sheel and Dick Johnson of Queensland. Well Sheel will be glad to get the car away because he stalled it at the start of the second heat and didn't figure in the results. Masterton in front though and Dick Johnson made a very good to be up there in third place, so he's much better placed than he has been in either of the previous heats. But Shields the one to watch, I would think. Marston's in front, and it's he who leads the point score, and also he who locks the break. But Shield could expect his Marston to be a little bit faster, being a little bit more nimble around the Amaru circuit. He'll start probing very early on, trying to get by Steve Marston and draw himself away from those in closer pursuits, like uh, Dick Johnson way back in third place, Gary Wilmington and Peter McLeod. And again, nibbling on the inside, but almost shoveling Master now out of the way then as he could appear in the of a jack. Well, it's Masterton in front going to the uh, top of Vichipave Hill. A little wiggly that time as he uh, just bounced off the wall. Shield was a little sideways coming over the top of the hill. And Shield is putting a lot of pressure on Masterton who went into that corner very fast. Here's Shield, goodbye now, on the inside and he's gone through to take over the lead. That puts Masterton back to second place in the Falcon and third place. Probably 40 metres away, Dick Johnson. Well, these big Falcons will have to go hard to keep Terry Shield within range because he is the lap record holder here. The circuit does suit the small and nimble RX-7s. And Steve Martin has been driving off a great deal of, of daring and more than a little aggression will really be... Oh, there's a real swing behind. Dick Johnson's been put off the track further back. We'll come back to that in a moment. He's OK, but he's gone off into the grass. A number of cars, including Gary Wilmington, went there. Dick is now rejoining the track, but he's back in uh, something like ninth place. So he has a lot of ground to make up. That looks like McLeod's Mazda down here that also uh, has got into the wall and cuts across the front of Alexander. But he uh, has already got the uh, front mudguard, of course, down on the tyre. Car is waltzing around everywhere, and that won't play uh, a great part in the outcome of this race. No, McLeod will be out. The two of them touch. There are a number of cars involved. Dick Johnson went wide. McLeod has the damage, though, and he's the one who will probably suffer the most. 
In the meantime, Terry Shield is just running away with it. Behind him, though, and keeping him inside and going as hard as he can, which today has been exceptionally hard, is Steve Marston. But Terry Shield, who just didn't figure in the results last time, he got up to, what, fifth place, but would have been a potential winner. Stalled at the start, made a good start this time, has polished off Steve Marston, and he's got his head down and he's going hard. And Terry Finnegan now, who's come through the melee of that scramble that put Dick Johnson so far back, is way back in third place, just ahead of Gary Wilmington. And this man has a lead at the moment of something like 80 metres over the second man. You can see the gap as Marston comes through. Then it's Finnegan. And then it's Gary Wilmington. They're the leading four. This is a man coming second. Something of a revelation today. And certainly, I think with this performance in the car now being prepared by Pat Purcell, Steve Marston has indicated he's going to be an absolute front runner this year. One well and truly able to put Falcons back in the winner's circle. And that's good news for Ford. Good news for Marston too, who really is an ambitious young fella and felt he wasn't doing quite as well as he should have, but he's got Pat Purcell now, the ex-former uh, car preparer for Bob Jane, who's with him. A little bit of locking of brakes, which he's had most of the races. It doesn't seem to be causing him any great trouble, except he certainly treads on those brakes heavily and we see plenty of smoke. But with Pat Purcell preparing the cars, he's going to have good machinery to drive with. And he certainly showed us today that he'll be in contention. The Better Break series conducted over three 10 lap races at each of the Amaru Park meetings. After two rounds today, going into this 10 lap final, Steve Masterton led the point score chase on 18 points. Terry Finnegan placed second on 17. Then Terry Sheil and Dick Johnson on 16 points apiece. Peter McLeod, the next driver, on 12 points. Masterton at the moment running in second place, but still the series leader. But this is the man who holds the lap record, so he knows how to drive quickly. He loves Amaru Park but hasn't had the best of fortune as some of the other circuits for driving very well. Now, what's his mind? Just nudge the curve there, which is as extreme a bit of driving as we can from Terry Shield. He is smooth. He's quick, but he doesn't make too many mistakes, and he really does point the car very, very well. Just watch him as he now comes through Winfield, which is a tough corner, more than a right angle bend to the right. You can see how the wall is scarred by those who got it all wrong. A very fast corner here. He'll take it close to the fence. But leaves himself just that nice little margin to do things properly, then takes a very clear line up the hill, comes in in a wide sweep up Bitchapove Hill, the long sweep to the top, comes over Dunlop, well in shape. There's uh, and the that's... leader's gap over Steve Masterton, back probably about uh, 75 metres, and then probably 50 metres back to Terry Finnegan, placed in third at the moment. Interesting to watch the driving styles and compare them. We'll follow Marston, he's driving the Falcon. It's a harder car to drive with the little lightweight Mazda. Much bigger car, wider and heavier. Marston driving very well, pushing hard. If anything, Finnegan's starting to make some ground on uh, Steve Masterton. Masterton still with that ominous puff of uh, smoke out the side every time to Honda Corner. And Finnegan has probably closed up to within oh, 20 or 30 metres now of Masterton. It does seem he has a locking brake problem. It doesn't seem to be slowing too much, but just taking off a few hundreds here and there. And Finnegan, who is very smooth, he is worth watching, he's very smooth, he is closing up all the time. You can see there Steve having trouble with the handling, you can see how much cleaner that the, the Commodore was through as, as Finnegan came through there. So Finnegan may be closing up, he's got himself only two laps to do it, you know, and I don't think the gap is, uh, is small enough for him to close the gap. There's certainly no doubt that unless something goes wrong with the leader, we're not going to see him overhauled by the others because with something like one and three quarter laps to go, Terry Shield really has this race in his in his pocket. He's driven beautifully. Very neat. He just, yeah, that was beautifully done that time. No sign of touching the curve, but he took a perfect line through there, swung the tail out nicely. Goes down towards Winfield, changing gears at the right time. Has time to glance at the instrument, see how things are going. A lead now of maybe 120, 130 metres over Marston who has uh, Terry Finnegan very close on his tail. You can see them there just as we sweep around to follow Finnegan up towards the last lap board, which he gets. That's it, last lap, one lap to go for Terry Finnegan. So those behind can give it away, but mind you, Ter Terry Shield rather, mind you, Terry Finnegan hasn't given away the prospect of catching the second man, Steve Masterson, but Shield has this race in the bag. A nice line around the top of the circuit. Shield coming down the back part of the course with uh, less than half a lap remaining. In great form here today at uh, Amaru Park. He's throwing the car around and just a little bit as he comes down to Honda Corner. Down through the gears. Superbly. He 
if he can get off the line at Amaru Park, he's a tough boy to beat in any company. Terry Shield, the Eurocars Mazda, heading down to Winfield Corner for the final time. A short straight battle for second behind them, by the way, Mike. Side by side, they are behind this man. There they go, and it's, a, oh, goodness me, it's the Commodore of Terry Finnegan who's gone through to take yes, second place from a disappointed Steve Marston. But this is the man who'll win the race. Terry Shield. Across the line, and he picks up the checkered flag for heat number three here today. A good win going to Terry Shield. And Marston came through at the very end with a tremendous passing manoeuvre. We were following the leader across the line, but Marston came back. He was passed on the second last corner by Finnegan, and he screwed up all his courage. Congratulations go to Terry Shield, who did a great job in the final. You look a bit wet, son. Very hot, Mike. Too hot. What sort of temperature are you talking about driving? Uh, well, I know it's about 36 outside. What's it like inside? It's pretty hard to say. The, uh, the engine temperature was off the dial. It's over 230. So what it is inside the cabin, I wouldn't... Uh, it would seem to me if ever you can get off the starting line here with your old trick, you're going to win a lot more races. That's the biggest problem, but uh, today it was just a case of too much heat and we got a bit of fuel vaporisation on the line and that was it. Bad luck, but uh, I think you're in pretty good shape at the next meeting. Well, I certainly hope so, and uh, if I may, I'd just like to thank all my crew and uh, Eurocars for supporting us again this year. Good on you. Well, 27 points will win the series for today, and the man who came up with 27 points was Steve Masterton, who's been in the war today. Come in, Steve. It's been in, uh, your day, so to speak. Hot water, cold water. Pretty warm indeed. It's a real pleasure to drive against gentlemen drivers such as Terry Shields and Terry Finnegan. Alan Grice? Uh, anyhow. I'd like to thank uh, very much my chief mechanic, Pat Purcell, who's done a marvellous job in, in rebuilding... Um, a bad car and turning it into a car that you can drive. It, it, it's really brilliant. We mentioned 50.